So we've been talking about thought patterns that we can engage in to feel happier. And the sad thing is that a lot of the time we're not engaging in thought patterns that feel nice. We're engaging in thought patterns that feel downright mean. Um, we're often engaging in thoughts that are kind of really critical. We have these terrible inner critics. And so sometimes when I talk to students about the thoughts that are going on in their head and they say the kinds of things that they're saying to themselves to me, it feels like if you ever said those things to a friend, like you'd get like kicked out of school, right? Like, like the way we talk to ourselves is incredibly, incredibly mean. That mean talk is your inner critic. And it's a thought pattern that we really need to deal with. But to see your inner critic in action, we're gonna do a little bit of audience participation. So we can see examples of the negative self-talk that we use with ourselves, and that's gonna help us fight it in the future. And so audience participation time, I want you to imagine, of course, none of this would ever happen to you, but imagine that you get a much worse grade on your next test than you thought. Like you get the test back and it's much worse than you thought. What are the kinds of things that you're saying to yourself? And just like yell them out, audience participation. I am stupid, right? Yeah. Failure. Oh, the, hmm? Failure. I'm a total failure. I'm letting people down. My parents are going to kill me. My teacher is going to hate me. I, mean, I can't tell my friends. They're going to think I'm stupid. You're lazy, like these value judgments. What about your future college and stuff? What are you saying? You suck. Yeah, you're never going to get into college, right? Like th these are all the things, right? So you know, like, you know what happens, right? But this is helpful, right? Because we're gonna go through the things you can notice to spot these inner critics, right? And these are the traits that your inner critic has and it's helpful to spot it. The first is it is overly critical. None of, like, you suck, you're a loser. Like, none of it was like, well, you tried, you studied hard. Like, you know, it's, it's been a tough time. We're in the middle of COVID. Like, it's just critical, 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 right? It only focuses on the negative, right? None of the things were even a little bit positive in there. It's just like extremely negative. And it tends to have this catastrophizing. It's like bigger than everything. I'm never gonna get into college. My parents are gonna hate me. I'm gonna let my friends down, right? Like it's bigger than it really should be, right? It also minimizes the good stuff, right? Like, you know, maybe you did bad on that, but like, you know, you did well, like in your athletic performance, or you like, you know, helped a friend who really needed it that weekend or something. Like you're not even noticing the good stuff is just gone. It's about you. I suck, I'm a loser, I'm lazy. It's really personalized, right? It also does a lot of mind reading often, right? And this is predicting how other people are gonna feel. I'm letting people down, my mom's gonna hate me, like, you know, I'm, my friends are gonna think I'm stupid, right? Like, you don't know what these, you can't read minds, right? You don't know what they're thinking, but you're kind of doing that mind reading. It's very black and white, it's very either or. Like, I failed or I'm great. Like, I'm gonna get into college or I'm not, right? There's no kind of shades of great thinking in there at all. You're fortune telling, you're predicting the future of what's gonna happen with what your parents think in college, right? You're kind of doing this fast forwarding that you shouldn't do. It's really emotional, right? All those words like suck, shame, like it's like they're like, they're visceral, right? When you hear those, you feel bad. It feels something when you have this negative self-talk. And there's all this self-talk that's about what you should be doing. I joke with my Yale students that you're shooting all over yourself. Ha ha ha, you're shooting all over yourself, right? But it's like, I should have studied more. I shouldn't be so lazy. I should have done better, right? Like, you know, there's a lot of moralizing kind of in there, right? That's your inner critic, right? That's who it is. And it raises a question, none of this feels good, right? We just talked about how the emotions that come with these are terrible. Why do we do this? And I think we do this, we beat ourselves up this badly because we kind of mistakenly think it's an effective thing to do. We think if we don't talk to ourselves this way, we'd never get anything done. And this kind of fits with what I often call the kind of drill instructor theory of motivation. We think that we are these like terrible cadets and our brain is like, if I just scream at you like enough, then you will get your acting gear and you will study and you'll get into a good college. Like we think this. And, and we're doing academic stuff, but this could be any kind of thing you're screaming at yourself for. I think we think it works. But that raises an empirical question. Does it actually work? And the evidence suggests it absolutely doesn't. All of these inner critical things that we engage with in ourselves wind up making us perform worse, if only because they make us feel negatively bad. And we know when we're in a negative emotional state, we're not gonna feel better. And so that raises the question of like, okay, how can we fight these things? And that's why we have this list, because we can go through one by one and fight them in our head. You'll have that thought automatically, but then you can fight it. So you hear like, you're a loser, you suck. Fight the overly critical part. You say, okay, like, I got one bad test score, people can get a bad test score and it doesn't mean they're a terrible person. Like if your best friend get a bad test score, you're gonna be like, you're a loser, you're never gonna get into college. You'd say, you know, we can accept this and move on, right? Try to switch actively to the positive, right? Like what are some good things that are in there, good traits that you have? 
when you hear yourself catastrophizing, I'm never going to get into college, just switch to this one word, possibly. I'll possibly never get into college. This will possibly affect my GPA, right? You can even, it's joking, right? But you see how quickly it softens just with that one word, right? Um, try to explicitly focus on the good. And when you're dealing with the personalization, I suck, I, 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 depersonalize it a little bit. Like, this has been a hard semester. Like, you know, sophomore year is really tricky. Like, you know, like, like the teacher didn't really teach like super awesomely this section, right? Like there are other people and other factors involved. You can remove it from yourself. Anytime you hear yourself mind reading, you just go to the strategy of remembering you're not a mind reader. I can't say what my mom's gonna think. I can't say what my teachers are gonna think. I can't read minds. And whenever you notice you're in like the full black and white, bring in a shade of gray. It's kind of like the possibly, like maybe, like maybe it's not gonna work that way, it's okay. When you realize you're fortune telling, just like explicitly build in the phrase to your brain, I don't know the future. Oh my gosh, I'm not gonna get into college. Wait, I don't know the future. I don't know the future, what's gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen on the next test, I don't know. When you experience the emotions, this is a spot where you can mindfully accept some of those emotions. Notice like, ah, when I say that to myself, I feel a lot of shame. And you just notice what that feels like. I don't have to keep you know, fueling the fire, but I'm gonna notice it feels bad. And when you notice the thing where you're shooting all over yourself, you can say, I could. I could have studied a little bit more. I could have slept better before this one, right? It's not like you definitely had to do it and you moralize it. It's like a thing that you could think about for the future, right? You notice how just switching those things, which are all things you can put in your brain when those words start happening, how it softens the blow of some of this stuff. It's a really powerful technique. But even more effective strategy for fighting your inner critic is to adopt a wholly different style than the drill instructor mode. It's a style of engaging in what we might call self-compassion. We're gonna define self-compassion as this attitude toward yourself that treats yourself with kindness. It shouldn't be so foreign as a concept, but it's really foreign as a concept. It's allowing yourself to understand that you can go through difficult times, that's just what it means to be human, and you're gonna make mistakes, and that is okay. It's not the end of the world, right? Psychologist Kristen Neff at the University of Texas, Austin, who studies self compassion in detail tells us that we should think about having self-compassion in three distinct parts. And they're parts that should seem familiar from stuff we've talked about in the class already. One is a sense of mindfulness. You should notice how your self-talk feels like, oh, I'm feeling shame or, oh, I'm feeling guilt or I'm feeling sad, right? You need to kind of know where you're at to know what you need to how to be kind to yourself, right? A second thing that we need to engage in when we're engaging in self-compassion is a sense of self-kindness. You should just be nice to yourself. Treat yourself like you treat a best friend. And this means you're not gonna be self-indulgent because if your best friend was doing something that were there being really indulgent, you might tell them, you wouldn't be like, you stupid jerk, you're a loser. You'd, like, you'd tell them about the indulgence in a nice way, but you wouldn't let them rest on their laurels. You'd push them slightly, but you'd push them in a kind way. That's self-kindness. And finally, the third part is that we need to recognize we're just human. We need to engage our common humanity. Sometimes bad stuff happens, right? And you're gonna be human, you're gonna make mistakes too, and that's okay. Um, Kristen Neff has found that this act of engaging in self-compassion can allow us to feel a little bit happier, it also can make us more productive. She's also found that there are ways to, to pay attention to self-compassion. In fact, she came up with this cool scale that we can use to pay attention to whether or not we'll, we're feeling self-compassionate. And so I'll give you just a couple examples of the things on her scale so you can get a sense. So it'd be questions like, I try to be loving to myself whenever I'm in emotional pain, a scale of I almost never do that to I almost always do that, or ones that might be reverse scored. So when I'm feeling down, I tend to obsess about everything and fixate on what's wrong. That's the opposite. If you almost always do that, you're not being very self-compassionate. So it's questions like this. And so she gives subjects these scales in a different study, and she finds that being more self-compassionate on that scale is correlated with overall being happier and having higher subjective well-being. It's also correlated with having lower levels of things like depression and anxiety. So it's helpful for reducing really clinical aspects of mental health issues. And it's correlated with not having a fear of failure. Because if you know you're not gonna beat yourself up really badly every time you mess up, you can actually push yourself a little bit more. So the irony is that the nicer you are to yourself, the more you're actually gonna push yourself, the better you're gonna do, the more persistent you're gonna be over time. And so we've just seen that self-compassion can make us happier, but it has all these benefits beyond making us happier. One is that there's evidence that self-compassion can improve your academic performance, like literally the opposite of the drill instructor mode. Why? Because Academic performance, doing well, requires messing up sometimes. And if you mess up and do badly and you beat yourself up and you hate yourself and you're mean, you're not gonna like try harder later. The evidence suggests that if you engage with self-compassion, you are, end up being more persistent. You push yourself when you're down because you're like not that beat up. You're not like additionally beat up after the bad grade or the bad test score. You like can push yourself a little bit more because you yourself are gonna be nicer to yourself. 
But there's also evidence that it helps us interpersonally. In fact, if you want to do something to improve your romantic relationships, your sibling relationships, one of the best things you can do is focus on self-compassion. Why? If you can be compassionate with yourself, who's the person we're meanest to, you can be compassionate more with the people around you and the people that you care about. And in addition, there's evidence that self-compassion can even help us in the worst of situations. Um, in fact, there's evidence that self-compassion can reduce things like PTSD um, in populations like military individuals, individuals who are in war. There's evidence that Kristin Neff has done these interventions where she teaches um, Iraq veterans and Afghanistan veterans to be a little bit more self-compassionate. And what she finds is that they're less likely to suffer from things like post-traumatic stress disorder. So even if you're going through a really traumatic time, you can help yourself by not additionally beating your own self up. And so that sounds like self-compassion is great. It raises the question of how can we be a little bit more self-compassionate? And again, we have our psych pro tips to help us, yay. Um, but one of the nicest ways you can improve your self-compassion is to commit to using kind words with yourself, um, to talk to yourself like you would talk to your best friend. Again, you're not gonna be self-indulgent. You're gonna like hold yourself to a high standard, but you're gonna do it in a nice way. So every time you hear that self-talk, think, would I tell my best friend that? And if you wouldn't, like commit to talking to yourself in a different way. But there's another way we can engage in self-compassion, which can be good even if our thoughts are a little short-circuited. We can engage with a behavior that's very nice to ourselves. And that's through the act of self-touch. Like if you had a younger sibling or a good friend who was going through something, you might like hold their hand or stroke and say, it's gonna be okay, right? You'd give a form of touch that was very compassionate. But the key is that your brain doesn't know who is touching you, right? If you do this act of like doing this nice touch on yourself, your brain thinks it's another person and it accepts that kind of kindness, right? So you can hack your own brain system and give yourself self-compassion through self-touch. So literally giving yourself a hug. It looks so cheesy and I know it sounds stupid, but your brain doesn't know. It feels like a hug from someone else or this kind of stroking, like where you're like, okay, I'm just being nice to myself. Again, sounds really cheesy, but your brain is just like, oh, there's a friend there that's like taking care of me. That's what your brain experiences. And you can do this even better if you pair this with thought patterns that mirror those three parts of self-compassion, right? Mindfulness, this is really hard right now. I am struggling. I am feeling really emotional. I'm at my wit's end, right? That's mindfully recognizing what's happening, acknowledging, right? Then trying not to be like perfect, right? Acknowledging your common humanity. Stress is a part of life. I'm only human. This is normal. This is what happens in high school. I'm not alone, right? And then engaging in this self-kindness, right? Like just literally say, I'm gonna be kind to myself right now. What can I take off my plate? Think of ways you could do nice things for yourself. What would you advise a friend? Think of how you can do that. Evidence, again, this sounds so cheesy, but like cheesy sometimes works. And the evidence suggests that in this case, it really can improve your overall well-being, your happiness, reduce depression, but it can also improve your academic performance. So engaging in fighting your inner critic, taking on a little bit more self-compassion. There are ways that we can fight our thoughts to feel better.